Welcome to the show, Ellen. Woo! He was also a fear factor. I just grabbed the pail and just threw it all up. The Amazing Race Asia. He really scripted it. No, 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 no. No, no, for real. He run through the campus naked. Eat goldfish. Left my real serious girlfriend. Why you drop her? Born in Los Angeles to Chinese immigrant parents and raised in the States, our guest for today has since been based in Singapore, China, and Bali. He's <gasps> an actor, host, entrepreneur, model, and now podcaster. Best known for being the host of three different editions of The Amazing Race. Welcome to the show, Alan. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. Welcome. What a riveting opening. Can you speak English? Uh, not really. Yeah, try, you try. So, I try. So, what do you want me to say? Uh? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, uh, I tell you, you close your eyes, I sound so Singaporean. Yeah. <laughs> How's that? How, how, you like, how do you like them apples? <laughs> You're so tired. I'm so tired. Yeah, tired. I'm tired. Yeah. So, something that I thought was actually quite a fun tidbit when I was doing my research on you, right, was that you actually changed your Chinese name when you wanted to go get into the industry because there was another celebrity, celebrity Francis Ng, who had the same Chinese name as you. Oh. Is this true? It is totally true. Wow, you have really done your homework. Yeah. I mean, I am, I'm, an, I'm, I'm now the number one fan of the daily catch-up. You're like, <laughs> you're my monthly catch-up, you know? Um, yeah, actually I did. I mean, my my birth name is Wu Zhen Yu. Mm. So then when I decided to enter this entertainment industry, that was my 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 name and my e Ming, you know, too. Yeah. But at that time I was in Hong Kong and I realized there was another actor there named Francis Ng, mm. Wu Zhen Yu. You know, just Wu Zhengyu. Same yeah. pronunciation, but different writing. Exactly. And then, uh, and so at that time I thought, okay, maybe it'd be better to change our names, you mm. know, in case people mix us up. And along the way, I actually did a movie with him back in the year 2000 called Ni Wo Zhe Shi. And in that movie, we were both in the same movie, you know, I think. And uh, he was a bad guy. I was a cop. And oh. then at that, that was what kind of like, I think was my impetus to, to want to change my, my Chinese e Ming. So when the opportunity for The Amazing Race Asia opened up, right? What was that like for you? He was also on Fear Factor. Yeah, I was on Fear Factor too. So I think at that time, I, I used to love watching Fear Factor. Yeah. So then I auditioned, I, I signed up for Fear Factor and I got if it. If you all want to watch something really cool and really disgusting, then go to YouTube and just search Alan Wu Fear Factor. Okay. I've never seen an episode where every contestant just throws up. Did you throw up? Oh, hell yeah. Oh my Wait, what God. Was the challenge? What was, yeah, what was the, the challenge? The Basically, I yeah, yeah. hold on, dude. don't get too excited. Oh, no, I, no. I don't, don't know what you're <laughs> Basically, in my episode, we went to a deserted uh, hotel in LA. So we go into this oh empty bar and they're, they're lined up with all these bottles, empty mm -hmm. bottles of alcohol. Each of us get a uh, gun with explosive pellets. Mm -hmm. We have a hundred explosive pellets. We have one minute to shoot these bottles, okay. all these bottles. Any bottle Sounds left okay. standing that you did not hit, Joe Rogan would pour in a whole okay. blender full oh. of live maggots, oh. live worms, live beetles, and rotten fish eyes. He pour it all in, oh blend it up, and every bottle you do not break, you have to drink a shot of it. Oh! So the first guy, this African-American guy, he left 19 bottles. Oh. So he drink 19 oh. shots of this thing. You can quit, right? <laughs> you, you know, you, well, the thing is that well, you, of course you, you have to finish it to continue to the next yeah, 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 yeah. You know? <laughs> Oh my you puke, God. You're out. Yeah, you puke, you're out. Oh, you puke, oh, you're out. You're you can't puke and continue. <laughs> yeah, but if you puke after, so then uh, I did it next. Uh, how many were? <laughs> I left how many shots? 35. 21 <laughs> bottles. Oh! So, <laughs> it's, this is, people, it, you, you should, I mean, you should watch this for yourself. So then I had 21 shots of like maggots and, you, and, and, and then like, it's just, you have to watch me drink it. You have to just drink it. It's just mind over matter. About, <laughs> yeah, you can't, it's just like, it's just, I talk oh, about, you know, no. uncomfortable situations, man. You just have to just down as fast as you can. Damn. And if you throw up before you finish, you're out. So you have to get all that shit down. And then once I finish it, I just grab the pail and just threw it all up. I just did it. Oh, you have to. Oh, oh so wow. you got it. Okay, okay, okay. And then there were two girls after us. Oh, oh no. How many? <laughs> <laughs> both of them. Both of them left 25 bottles. Oh. Jesus. And the stuff is thick. It's viscous. You can taste like the wings and, and, and the legs oh. and all the acid from the stomach acid from oh. the bugs and everything too. One girl, she was like this 
cop that wanted to be a cop from Las Vegas, huge fake silicon boobs. I thought she was like oh. a man, was like very masculine. And she like, <laughs> by the third one, by the third one, she's like, you know, there was, there's one you little good, like a kind of little sorority girl from yeah, Florida. Yeah. <laughs> she took one sip of it and just gave up. The one from, you know, Las Vegas was, you know, very cocky and confident. Mm -hmm. Drank two by the third one, you know. She's already <laughs> started, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh God, this is, and 25 shots. This third shot, she's already, already oh convulsing God. and shit, you know? And like, and I'm going, she's not gonna make it, dude. She's not gonna make it. I want to try it. So, oh, you should, oh, that oh, would be so what, What's the hey, most similar that, tasting you to try food to that? It's just really, really rancid, really acidic, really salty, but it's also very chunky. It's hard to describe. Chunky and then, soy the, sauce. Have you had yeah. maggots before? Chunky no, soy sauce. Well, it's not like the it's stuff just, you get in Bangkok, right? Like the, oh, no, the, no, the, the, no, no, fried. no, because that, the stuff you get in Bangkok is all deep fried. Yeah, yeah. So it's all, it looks really nasty. Yeah. Cause it's all like exoskeleton, yep. like scorpions, but inside all the flesh, all the tissue is all gone. It just looks really disgusting. Yeah. But it's just like, like it's like eating like, you know, like something, some deep fried, like, you know, it's not, there's nothing really to it. It's, that's easy stuff. Yeah. They, they season it too. <laughs> yeah, this yeah, mine's not stuff. seasoned. Oh. Mine's just like live, they just pour it in and stuff, you know, like just, Oh, Word. it's live. It's, it was live. They blend it. They, blend they pour it. It's live. They blend it right there. <laughs> you feel so like that was so like in like the two thousands, eh? Oh, so long ago, early two thousands. Yeah, yeah. They, they blend it. Oh he puts it in God. all the blender, like the maggots. It's all they're all moving, and they pour it in. Oh. You know? How is this safe? They have something called. They pay people professionally oh. called testers. Oh. So they actually have to test <laughs> it all to make sure that we don't die. <laughs> Otherwise, it's a big lawsuit. So they actually pay people before us to actually try this stuff oh, too. That's, that's, get paid that's to a try. shit job. So, yeah, but they get, yeah, hey, you get paid a lot. Get, they get paid a lot. Yeah. You know? But definitely, yeah, after the show, just if you want just some fun, watch it. I'm getting back to all of your questions. I think after that, Thank I was you. like, it's fun being a contestant, but I thought maybe it's better to be a host. Mm -hmm. I get to come back every season. I get paid. Mm -hmm. You get to and, blend the and nuggets. I, and I don't have to eat this shit, you know. Like, yeah. Yeah. So I remember like uh, Ling, also from Fly, said, oh, you know, they're auditioning for a host for this new show called The Amazing Race Asia. Mm. You know, would you would you want to, you know, audition? Right. And in the end, it came down to me and this one other guy from Thailand. It was just mm. us two at the Sony office. I didn't think I would get it, but then then I ended up getting the job. Then it was, it was, yeah, it was the beginning of my career where I focused less on Media Corp and then became more regional with The Amazing Race Asia. Mm. Damn. Are you able to share with us a bit of the behind the scenes? So yeah. Alison is very, very interesting. It's very curious because I watched Amazing Race, right? And then you know how as a host, you, you yeah. just say go and then they run off. Then what yeah. do you do after that? <laughs> All he does is say go and just hang yeah, out and just sit there five times and you're like, you are that's team number true, one. That's well, true. Because the next time we see you, right, is during the B-roll that you're explaining. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, then like, you only appear at the end and then you have to wait for every contestant to come. Yeah. Okay. So the, very, the only time I say go is in the very, very first yeah. episode. Mm -hmm. right. We line them up, we introduce yeah, them to the go. show, what's at stake and everything too. Once I say go, they're off running doing their thing. Mm -hmm. Then I go with, I have my own crew, I have my own cameraman, my own sound man, yeah. and I also have like host producer. Right. So then we have to go to the more, I think the larger challenges, mm -hmm. the detours, you know, explaining mm -hmm. that. So I go to the actual location before uh, them right. to explain what's going to happen, you right. know, at that challenge, at that detour, at that, you know, roadblock and everything to what that is. Mm -hmm. And I go to the next one. And then sometimes if let's say the teams are moving too fast, mm -hmm. then I, I cannot be, I, they cannot see me at all. Yeah. So oh. if they're coming fast, I have to leave. If I don't get it done, I have to go, but I have to try and get done as fast as I can. Oh. So I go to maybe two or three different locations and then regardless of where I am, if I know a team is going really, really yeah. fast, then I have to go to the pit stop and I wait. Oh. But the whole time I'm always doing something. I'm I'm shooting right. separately. Like you see that B-roll. Yeah. You know, <laughs> 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 you know, I hear you. Like, I'm just kidding. So then, yeah. So then I'm actually the whole time rushing around oh, too. But right. then the second they're like on their way to the pit stop, like yeah. there might be one stop. Let's say one little you know, intersection or yeah. something, whatever it is, yeah. or fast forward. Like sometimes fast forwards are crazy because mm -hmm. fast forward, like I mean, they might have a whole route, right, of yeah. stuff they do. But fast forward, they get that they can skip oh, everything yeah. and go right to the pit stop. They have to just kind of stop right. doing everything, stop. go do that, and sometimes go back and do my oh. B roll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so I'm always running around. But everyone just says, all he does is just stand there, like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so now you know. So I'm, 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 all, I'm, I'm moving not constantly. Because they're too. late. Like, you know, sometimes they miss a flight and then they are, but like, the first group and the last group is very far. Uh -huh. So yeah, you yeah, just oh, yeah. wait. Oh, dude, oh, I've uh, waited forever. I think oh, the, worst no. is, the worst is when teams, like, have self driving. 
and oh. then they get lost. Like oh. one time in Taiwan, right? Taiwan, like we were supposed to stay in Taipei. Somehow they went end up going like get dinged. They ended up like going down south. Oh. And I have to sit there and wait. And I missed my flight. I think oh. I waited like 16 hours. Oh my God. On the first and the last team, I missed my flight to Europe because I was waiting for this team. You know, they just, because oh. they just, they just completely got lost. Right. They went completely the wrong way. So whenever you self-drive, I'm going, oh shit, dude, this is going to get, this is going to be long, you know? Because at least if they're calling a cab right, or they're, right, right. you know. Yeah, producer you, one night. Uh, yeah, he's them at the, the, like, No, they, they won't. Get, oh. They won't. They just, they, they so love it's it. Real. They won't it's place real. this content it's all real, driving man. all the way down. Wait, 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 yeah, it's real. It's I always real, thought man. it was stage. Like, oh no, it's real, it. man. Yeah, I thought it was heavily scripted. No, 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 for real. For, real. No, I, I swear. <laughs> for, for real. every real, trust me, what? yeah, for real. It's a real race, yeah. It's like a real, real race. It's not scripted at all. Is it? Is it uncomfortable and awkward when you have to eliminate them? Or when you tr when you're trolling if them. I don't if I if I really <laughs> like him it is but a lot of times I don't like him like I'm like the fewer the less you have to worry about like this is, oh. I'm like it's, it's a non elimination round ah oh, <laughs> let's eliminate someone you know oh. and those are those are the, and then, then it's my job you know to make it seem like it's an elimination or non elimination yeah. and get all the emotions out you know mm. everything I do on these shows reality it's not about the actual race or where we go that's mm. all part of it yeah the real I think the real beauty about the show is the human relationship how they deal with each other with relationships and how they you know I think mm. conquer that you know let's say with your mom or your sister, mm -hmm. your boyfriend or your friend, like we put them in a situation, uncomfortable situations and see whether they prevail mm -hmm. or whether they fail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, but yeah, it, it's it's all real. I wish, it, so I'm just, I'm just sitting there like by myself, like for <laughs> waiting for this team, like just for 10 hours, you know, really tired, like team coming, team coming, like to get up and like, Get in position and do your thing. Mm -hmm. It's it's a lot of work. Also, yeah, that's why you always look a bit sleepy. Yeah, not always. <laughs> always. <laughs> 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 Don't tell the truth, you know. I saw yeah. the YouTube comments. They said you had a very good poker face. I do, I do. Because you have yeah. to hide I'm the face. I'm a mysterious man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah, you have to hide. Yeah, because it's, it's my job to really draw out the emotions, right? Sometimes, yeah, like you yeah. know, you you talk to them. You kind of you know, I'm with, at the pit stop, that's yeah. where that's that's when my show really begins. Yeah. It might be a non-elimination round, but then mm -hmm. I get them like almost to the point of crying and stuff, yeah. or crying because yeah. they love the show, they love the experience, mm -hmm. and they think they're eliminated because they did a really bad job. Then I tell them, you know, it's it's <laughs> yeah. a non. They just and you watch that human emotion from just that sadness and that pain to being like, wow, man, yeah, I'm still in it. They love it. And that's what people love to watch right. more than anything. Yeah, it's beautiful. But like five seconds after the yell cut, do they like cuss at you a little bit for like- Oh yeah, they will. <laughs> you know? oh, yeah, yeah, they will. I totally will. Are you <laughs> asshole? You know what I mean? So yeah. what was life like for you like growing up in the States, especially because I mean, recognizably you are not, you don't really blend in with the typical American, right? So. Did you have maybe struggled with your identity growing up in the States? I want to say there's a culture clash, but I always felt different. Even though I was born in the States, it was just difficult, I think, to try and, to try and fit in. Everyone was, you know, Ang Mo was, you know, was, was Caucasian where mm. I grew up. And then would maybe be maybe one or two other Asian families when I was mm. really, really young. Mm. And, and here you are, you know, you see media, you see everyone around you. You want to try and dress like everyone. And then my parents being very Chinese were very, I don't want to say parsimonious, but very frugal, you know, like they would never want to spend spend money on, mm. on clothes in the States. And it, it's just, and they don't know, their English isn't very good, right? So they give mm. me like this really thick, like, you know, long, like a, like a sweatshirt like, like this. Fleece. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and it would say like, you know, summer has come. <laughs> and you know, it was really fleece. And it'd be like this really thin shirt. And it'd be like, winter has come. And I'm wearing this to school, right? Everyone's uh -huh. wearing like polo and top siders all nicely dressed. And oh yeah, OP. the 70s fashion. Yeah, and then I was just, I was, I was wearing like all this fobby clothes, you know, like just trying to, to, to fit in, even though I didn't know what I was doing. Mm. And on top of it, it was hard because when I was really young, my parents obviously they weren't they weren't they didn't grow up there. So the English was not very good. Right, so right, then right. listening to their English, speaking listening to them speak Chinese, my English was really bad also. So I remember in I second see. grade they said, you know, Alan, your, your English is terrible. You need to go to a special class called uh, ESL, mm -hmm. which is English as a second language. There was pressure, you know, I think the most pressure probably would have come from my own parents. You know, I think my mom, especially, she was just very, your typical Chinese parent, like, uh, I wouldn't say like a tiger mom, but yeah, definitely like a tiger. She definitely wanted us to work hard and she wanted us to do well academically like any parent would. Mm -hmm. But I think me being in that environment, trying to fit in, I realized no matter how well I did academically, I would never still be considered cool or accepted in this wider, mm -hmm. I think, society society in, in white America. And I think for me, the way of fitting in was through athletics, through sports. All my friends are Caucasian, we're playing different sports like kickball, handball, mm -hmm. you know, doing well in school. So it was trying. And I think what was cool about that was, was being 
adept in sports. Mm. I think just more, I think being athletic, you know, I think, you know, it was just being more all around versus just being like a nerd and everything too. So that's what kind of led me, I think, to go along that path versus just being like an academic, I think though, too. Mm. Trying to fit in using athletic and sports to seek that affirmation and that acceptance from the greater audience that was mainly white. So you did go on to, in uni, I believe you went to UC Berkeley. Oh yeah, and very then, good. You know, whenever we watch TV and then when they have any university scenes, they always talk about the... Fraternities, fraternities and sororities. Yes, were yeah. you in one? I was in one. Oh. I was in one too. You know, I mean, you don't. Yeah, if you go over there, you're not. You don't go there not to go in a fraternity, right? I think for me, life, I think, is all about experiences. We did a lot of stuff. We had some that had to, you know, run through the campus naked. Oh, eat goldfish. I mean, yeah. I goldfish. Eat goldfish. You drink a lot of alcohol. Um, yeah, I did a lot of things, man. Yeah, so I mean, it's and uh, so they basically they're just they're just messy. You have to wash all the dishes for all the current active, I think you know, fraternity brothers. You know, uh, so they make you do a lot of things okay, on top of it. That seems easy compared to the goldfish. Yeah, the goldfish. Yeah. No, you cook the goldfish. Yeah, it's, a live, it's a live goldfish. That's live goldfish. You're eating it live. Oh my god! Yeah. Yeah. Drink you drink it. You drink it. You just swallow the whole thing. Oh my god! You yeah. dare not. He there, he come up there. I should have bought some goldfish fish for you guys here right now. You know? I feel like you do it just for the challenge of seeing whether you can do it. It's like so I have to run the gut and, and then eat well, the that, That's separate, separate. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then, uh, then easy, sure. <laughs> Was the whole fraternity experience something that you, you think is very beneficial? Like you will want your children to have that. I look back, it's one of those things where I think because you're, you're so, you're in this environment, right? I think it's your first time leaving your parents' house. So it's not like going to NUS, you know, where you might be living at home, you know, you might yeah. be in a small little dorm here. Like mm. you have people from you're all around the world converging yeah. in this school and you're just trying to find your place, find your identity. You know, it's not all about, you know, the case mm -hmm. and drinking and, and sleeping around and partying and throwing up and everything too. There's a lot of that too. <laughs> Definitely an experience. I think for me, life is all about experiences. I mean, to go through that and to become a mm -hmm. pledge master and to join a fraternity. I mean, for my daughter, you don't want to join one, that's fine. You know, something that I probably didn't really need in my life, but at that time I think I did, you know, yeah. I was just, mm -hmm. I was very, very sheltered. You know, I, you know, I was just so obsessed, you know, with trying to do well in school and sports. Like I never really dated in high school. I never drank any alcohol in high school. Mm. And I go into college and at this very liberal school where we have naked people walking up and down the street, hippies, you know, there's marijuana everywhere on the oh. street. It's funny because my daughter now is in college. Mm. Yeah. So she's in college and then she like went through rushes. She, she knows I was in a fraternity. She's like, oh, you know, I went to rush. I'm like, how was it? She's like, oh, it's not really for me. You know, it's oh. kind of lame, you know? And she, she went to my fraternity for a party. She's okay. like, oh, oh, I think went to my fraternity back, but not in the same school. Oh, okay. So she's at Stanford. Yeah. I was at Berkeley. We we're like super competitive, like rivals, right? It's oh. like, you know, I went to your, your uh, went to your fraternity at my school for your party. I, I, I hear they're all gay. I'm like, uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. What were you actually studying? Or do you study? <laughs> you were there? He was just <laughs> Is that what you do in school? I think being your typical Asian guy that knew, had no idea what he wanted to do. Right. I just thought, okay, I'll just do science. I'm a freaking, I'm Asian. I'm a nerd. Let's just do it, you know? <laughs> so you did go on to work in a biotech company for a few years. And then I did. what was it that suddenly made you go, I want to be an actor. For me, I graduated and I was planning on taking the MCAT, which is the admission test for medical school. Yeah. But I did, what I did learn was like, I'm not a very idle person. I don't like to sit and read. I'm not, and I decided not to do the MCAT and then I got a job at, a, at the third largest biotechnology company. Mm -hmm. So I was working in R&D with cutting edge technology, but you're sitting in a lab Ooh. by yourself, you know, oh. working. And I was like, here I am in this lab. I'm like, this is, if this is the rest of my life, I'll, I'll, I'll myself. Yeah. So I need I need human interaction. I'm just looking at cell culture all day oh. and everything too. So then I did that for a couple of years. So for two years I worked there and Were I thought- Were you good at it? Dude, I'm good at everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. This is like, you know, kind of like a moment, like I need to figure out what I really want to do with my life. So then mm. I quit that. And then when I went to go work for a small healthcare consulting company too. So I worked there for six months and it was maybe just 10 of us. You know, you go from a role where you're very specialized doing research mm. and development to where you're it's doing a small company, you're doing everything. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. I'm taking out Many the trash, heads. I have to go buy <laughs> lunch, you know, like you do, you know, watering the plants along with your work in a chair all day too. Like mm -hmm. just doing all this stuff, you know, stuff. And I'm getting zits on my butt from sweating, you know, just, I'm like, dude, I don't like this. Not, I'm not vibing with this. I can't sit right. here for this long. And then what kept me like going, what kept my my passion going during that entire time of working was snowboarding. And then on this one trip, this, this was one defining moment that kind of led me to where I am here today. Oh. On one of my trips with my friends, we went up to Lake Tahoe and then we're just young, you know, a lot of testosterone, a lot of trash talking. It was like the last run of the day. And then we did a lot of jumps, a lot of big jumps. And it was already kind of cloudy. You couldn't really see, it, was, it wasn't very clear. And it was like the last jump, you know, we we're gonna, you know, we we're gonna call it quits after that day. And we're all egging each other on, talking a lot of trash. See, come on, Alan, go big, go for it, right? So I just barrel down this mountain up this huge uh, tabletop, which is like a big jump with, it goes up like this and it's flat like a table and then back down. Mm -hmm. oh. So I, I did the jump 
And I went so fast, I completely <gasps> missed, missed that. Uh-huh. And I'm in the air like this. My whole body just goes completely inverted like that. And I land on my wrist uh-huh. and then all these bones. There's actually um, eight carpal bones here were just shattered. They just, all the ligaments just shattered, just stacked up like that. Uh-huh. All of it, you know, and I was like, my, my, I was like, oh my God, I thought all the ligaments and tendons, everything was just destroyed. Oh my God. So then we were supposed to snowboard like a couple more days, but after that I had to go to the ER. We went to a hospital nearby and then they had to like, you know, like just kind of straighten out, just neutralize it. Then mm-hmm. they had, I had to go back, wade back towards Oakland, back towards San Francisco, towards Berkeley to get like a nine hour surgery. And it was <gasps> during that time I thought like, this whole time, I've never known what I want to do with my life. Sorry, shut up. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So then, um, so then, at that, that was that, that was that, it was that moment I realized like your entire life can change at the blink of an eye. Mm. And so I thought I better start doing what I want to do. My whole life, mm. you know, when I was in high school, when I was in college, I just did this major. You know, I just worked here. You know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I thought, okay. I've always enjoyed making my friends laugh and having mm. fun. Maybe I'll give this acting thing a try, you know, and everything though too. And that was like, kind of like my first foray, but the problem was I had no formal training at all. So then I went to this place called uh, the American Conservatory Theater, which is where like, you know, Denzel Washington mm. and Tom Hanks went. Whoa. So I started taking classes there too. And then did I need an agent too? And I would go into these agencies and I, I got rejected everywhere. You know, they just, cause I had no, I had no experience at all. Mm. In San Francisco, they're all consolidated. Mm. So one agency can have talent and also modeling. So the agent says, you know, hey, you know, have you ever considered modeling? I was like, modeling? Like, I never thought I could model. And I guess they needed a token Asian model, right? Some guy to represent all the Asians in San Francisco. So that, I thought, okay, shit, let's give this a shot. After I signed with that agency, within three weeks, I mean, my very first job ever was doing this 3D scan for Nike sunglasses for Ooh. Asian faces. So that was ah. right when Nike was going to do Asian fit sunglasses. Right, right, so I did, right. I was, I like held my head very still and they did this 3D scanner on my face for the, the topography of my face right. to design sunglasses for Nike for, for Asian fit. That was kind of like my, the beginning of me, I think getting into acting, but it was more through modeling because I had no experience. My friends from college, they're already working in Hong Kong and Taiwan. They were like, Alan, you got to come out here. You will kill it out here. And I said, yeah, I want to come out, but I don't want to buy a ticket and everything too. So my friends actually took the time to look for this thing called courier flights. So back then you could take this thing called a courier flight where you act as a courier to bring time sensitive material from one place to Mm. another. Uh, Legal stuff. The only catch was you had to drop everything and fly the next day. So I basically dropped everything. He found me this flight. I dropped everything I was doing and then flew out to Hong Kong. And then that's where I began my my journey here in Asia. How long were you there in Taiwan? Two years. And you were ready to drop everything to go there for two years? I didn't know how long it would take. I oh, think I just dropped me. I dropped, I didn't. I left my my just family. Try. You know, yeah. like I had a real serious girlfriend, oh, yeah. and I just went. You know, went out there just to kind of give it a shot. You know, I think there was there's not there's no harm in trying. Right? How you drop her? I dropped her. Yeah. Oh, you see, you see. No, she was like my college sweetheart. I yeah. Mean, she was like my first serious girlfriend, and I mean, I think for me, we were so. I mean, that's that's probably my biggest regret was that we didn't have very good closure because I was not very good at communicating back then though mm. too. And I mean, she was really in love with me, and I I loved her a lot too. But I think for her. Her, we, she was on the track where her parents got married early. She's half Mexican, half Chinese, mm. five nine model, you know. I think, and then went to school with me. And if I stayed with her, we would have been married. I never would have come out here to Asia. But uh. I think she was already looking at rings, you know. And I think for me, moving out to Asia to Taiwan at that time was kind of like my way out, you know. And she she was willing to sacrifice everything to come out to Taiwan with me. Ooh. But it was just me just trying to spread my wings and kind of like figure out what I really wanted in life. Mm. You know, she was adamant about coming out. And I was like, you know, you don't, she, I mean, I spoke a little bit of Chinese because my parents are Chinese. Mm. She had no, no Chinese at all. You know, and you, in Taiwan at the time, you had to speak Chinese. Yeah. And I think for me, I just, I wouldn't say I thought she would, slow me down or, or bring me down or encumber me. But I think I just wanted to be alone. Maybe I just really wanted to be single and just kind of see what the world had to offer. Did you didn't see her in your future plans? I saw it, but I think I was just, at that time I was like maybe 24, 25. Oh, you were, you were young. I was oh, young. So young. Yeah. I was young. Yeah. I was on the path. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And she, we were together for like four years already too. We we're already ready to get married, you know, mm. I think. And I was like looking at rings. I was like, wow, this is like, it was like a, I was on a, on a, on a tipping point. Like yeah. either I stay there and get married and, and live this life, you know, I do, you know, doing biotech or science, you know, there were so many question marks. And I just was so unsure of myself too. I mean, I think for me, I think for a lot of men in general, you know, want to, you know, have everything in place. They want to know like their career is stable before mm. they get serious so they can provide yeah. Yeah. for their loved ones. And I think though too, at that point I was, I already, gotten out of the whole corporate world. I was just starting my career in acting and had this opportunity in, in Taiwan. So I said, screw it, let's give it a shot. 
you know, but at that time I didn't want to have her go all the way there, you know, and then and then suddenly, you know, have to go all the way back or something. So mm-hmm. I said, I'll, I'll give it a shot. But I think deep down inside, it was also me kind of running away from okay. that reality of, of possibly, you know, yeah. like settling oh. down and getting married at such a young age, I think, yeah. too. So yeah. it was tough. It was really tough. So you didn't consider trying long distance? We did it for a little uh-huh. while, you know, but I think after a while, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, after a while, I just realized like, I just, I just, I just enjoyed I wouldn't say being single, just I just was not ready, I think, to be in such a serious right, relationship. Right, right. Yeah. Eventually you did get the chance to come to Singapore. Yeah. And that was how you ended up, you know, in a sense getting scouted and then moving to Singapore. Can yes. you tell us that story? I had no plans to go to Singapore, but my agent in Hong Kong said there's actually a job in Singapore called Communicasia. It's like this huge convention over at the Singapore Expo where they get like all these different, you know, I think tech companies, you know, mm. they come in and showcase their latest wear. NTD Docomo, they're like the Singtel of Japan, mm-hmm. hired me to like, you know, I think represent them and showcase all their new stuff. So then I flew here, it was, I was only here for a week. Mm. During that week, I had a friend of mine that I had modeled with throughout all of China when I was in Hong Kong, an Ang Mo model. I said, look, since I'm here, <laughs> I know Singapore was really, really well renowned. You got introduced me to an, a model agency mm-hmm. here, you know? She said, okay, I stand with Mannequin, Mannequin Studio. So I went there and I met their GM, her name's Serafina. And Serafina's like, you know, says, Alan, when I see you, I just see dollar signs. I said, oh, <laughs> Beautiful. That sounds good. That's, that's, that's a good Perfect. start. That sounds great, you know? ka that's great and all, but I never really felt it as a model. I said, I really want to get into acting because that's what I originally wanted to do. Introduce you to Irene Ong over at Fly Ooh. Entertainment. So it was there, that's where I said, so I went, that's where I met Irene and her team at that time. So they saw me like, you know, I wouldn't say it's they're like, wow, this guy is actually not bad. <laughs> you know? So let's go introduce him to Media Corp. It was love at first sight. So yeah, so then they introduced me to Media Corp. Media Corp is like, wow, this guy's, you know, this guy is pretty tasty. You know? <laughs> at that time, now I'm just sour. But, um, <laughs> but back then I was still kind of sweet, you know? And so they met me like, wow, this guy's pretty cool. Yeah. And again, we met, we talked and I left. I left Singapore, never think I would ever go back, mm-hmm. you know? And then uh, I get this call from this, uh, Artist at the time who was his name's Hosean Leung. Ah, so Hosean yeah. at that time was working for Fly. I said, you know, hey, Ali and I tell you, uh, <laughs> uh he's like, got, oh, he I tell you, we, we Media Corp really likes you. Would you like? Would you? Would you want to come to Singapore and and work? I was like, w- w- I can understand what you're saying, man. Like, <laughs> you know. And then they were signing, so then yeah, so basically Media Corp. Is I think, English. Yeah. So I said, ah, at least they're giving me an offer. If I go to China, I have to start over and kind of like, oh, you know, start, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. start all from, from scratch again. But I already have a whole, you know, network that's interested. So I said, screw it, let's move over here. So I moved here, mm-hmm. you know, hosted Talent Time 2001 with mm-hmm. Jane Danker <laughs> and did my very first Chinese drama called He Sui San. It was yeah. San Shi Ji. It was like a big blockbuster. Mm. And it was like, you know, with Chi Wu and like, you know, uh, Chen Shou Li and like, you know, Chen Simei, you know. It was funny because like, they're like, they, they gave me the stack of 30 Juban, you know, scripts. Mm. I said, uh, you can show one to Exactly. Uh, I can't read Chinese. And I'm like the lead, lead, lead guy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it was, it was probably the hardest thing I ever did. You know, I think for three and a half, I think by, by the third day, the EP, the Genji came down, just watched me. It basically slapped me with like the, the biggest, like, you know, the, the most, I want to say humiliating thing, but I was, I got dubbed. By the third day, they said, we have to dub oh, him, sure. you know. Oh, no. Everyone else is all xianchang, you know, sewing. For oh. me, they, I even told the Genji, I told the EP, like, look, if you want to find someone else, I completely understand because I'm completely not equipped to handle being like the way in Nanzuja, like the main guy that right. everyone mm-hmm. is dealing with the whole time, you know? Right. And everyone's, everyone's waiting to take turns, you know, to, to act with me. And I'm like, dude, I, I'm just trying to get through my lines here, <laughs> let alone try and act, you know? <laughs> and so, um, but in terms of mentor, I think all the, you know, like, you know, Shang Yunjie, you know, all the, mm. the senior actors and mm-hmm. even like Awa, they're all so, so they understand like this guy's like, his Chinese is shit, but he's, 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 He's trying really hard. He's trying, mm-hmm. to, and that is is all that they really need, though. Too, you're trying to act. You know, there's yeah. three cameras, and there's yeah. so much verbiage. And I'm I'm exhausted. You know, I was exhausted. But wait, uh, why didn't they identify this during like your table reads and stuff like that? Usually, when they do a Chinese drama, we just go right into it. They even oh. did like a rehearsal. They, they okay. did like a little rehearsal with me and everything too, with me and like you know, Ah, with mm-hmm. like, why are we doing this for this new guy? All you know, Ah Wu and Ping Hui, all these guys like, who's this new guy that they got? Mm-hmm. came and read and shit, you know. <laughs> and so, and so it was pretty funny. So but they kind of knew I had that problem, but yeah. they didn't know how grave it was because yeah. when I speak, it sound I sound very fluent. Because I just, it's just very it's conversational. conversational yeah. It's not like, you know, Chen Yu Yao, it's like, you know, Gu Dai, all this crazy yeah. stuff going on. But <laughs> when you start <laughs> acting, it's like, I was like, dude, dude, plus you have to act, you're memorizing lines, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was the beginning oh, of my I real journey. So I learned to speak Chinese in, in Taiwan, but I learned to read Chinese here in Singapore. Right. Oh. So that was the beginning of my journey, I think, with um, Singapore, with Mannequin, of course, with Fly, and of course, with Media Corp, too. So what was your first impression of Irene? Ah. 
Oh, Irene, so I know, yeah, yeah, what do I, my first is still the same, man. She's, um, she's amazing. She's got a heart of gold. You know, I love her to death, you know, but you know, I think, I think she, she's funny looking, you know, she's a door. I mean, she's great. She just wants the best for her people she loves, you know, too. Mm -hmm. She only means well, she's never changed that. You know, I think, uh, just a ball of, a ball of energy, a lot of passion, you know, sometimes she thinks she's funnier than she really is, but sometimes she is, sometimes <laughs> like, okay, you're not that, you know, you got those old auntie jokes and you're, you're an auntie, you know, but, uh, it doesn't have to be that auntie-esque, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I love her to death. You know, she's like my, like my mom, I think though, mm. too. Even though she's like maybe only a couple of years older. So when you when you decided to officially like move here, mm. what was something about Singapore that really shocked you? Shock. Yeah, like culture shock. Or you want to stay? Oh, oh, I think I think for me, honestly, in the beginning, it was probably just the weather. You know, I think I just wasn't used to. At first, I was like, oh man, this place is always so hot and humid. You know, always I saw everywhere just sweaty. Oh. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's huge. I sweat a lot. I. I don't, I've never met anyone that sweats as much as me and I'm actually quite proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one thing. And getting back, I think at that time when I was still trying to understand Singlish, right? I remember when they were telling me about that role for Hussui Sen, right? Mm -hmm. My manager at that time, it wasn't Irene, it was this girl named uh, Lim Suan. She, like, she, she would tell me, oh, you know, there's this new uh, Chinese drama and the corrector is very good. And I was like, what's, what's corrector? What's corrector? I, I couldn't <laughs> understand what corrector, corrector was. And I really, after a while, I realized it was character. Yeah. You know, I was like, corrector, character. character. Like, what is that word? Like, it took me a while to, I could like, corrector, what are you correcting, you know? <laughs> corrector, corrector, you know? So but I was you like- just pretend you understand what she's saying. Like, yeah, you know, like, yeah, 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 but I'm thinking, what the hell? What, what are you trying to say? You know, what are you trying to say? I don't understand your language, man. You saw that one. This was, ah, shit, you know? Know? I first know you with, uh, it's just like your face on men's health. Oh, okay, yeah. Men's it's just health. a poop. Like, like, yeah. like in the supermarket, you know, like I want to buy a teenage magazine. <laughs> but then you are at the side. And I was like, oh. <laughs> Huh? Handsome. Handsome. <laughs> and so, I mean, I've, I've shot oh. a lot of men's health covers too. So I would ask mm. you which one I've done, you know, all around the region. So it's kind of like my, my yeah, I, I'm actually proud of it. You know, I did yeah, the yeah. very first for men's sure, health here sure. in Singapore mm. back in 2003, when the very first, at very first issue. And I did another one, I think maybe the last, maybe one of the last issues mm. when they stopped circulating, like maybe four or five years ago. Is it weird to like, have your bare body everywhere. It's just like, like the media that. sexualizing you, you know. You know, the whole life, I've always had people just always want, want me to take my clothes off, you know? I'm like, I don't know why. I think, I wish it was good or bad, you know? So then I've gotten so used to it. But I remember when I was still married or with my girlfriend, like they would get so annoyed because you had guys and girls always wanting me to take uh, my clothes off. And I'm like, yeah. and it, at that time it was, it was just very awkward, you know? Mm. And now that I'm older, like it doesn't happen as much, maybe because I'm just an uncle now, right? You know what I mean, too? <laughs> but then it actually happened a couple of weeks ago with like, a, I was in back in Bali and then there was, I was some friends and they had like another friend that brought, that they just brought and I was just wearing like a t-shirt. I guess you could tell that I, I work out mm -hmm. and got, she got drunk, you know, older lady and just, they just, their hormones just start, they just start getting really excited. <laughs> oh, I just could not, the whole night just became me having to take my clothes off again. I'm like, I guess I still, I might be old, but I can still do that. They still need it. <laughs> But what? yeah, but like you to answer your question, I think it's gotten to a point where like, I mean, I was, I think it was probably more self-conscious because yeah. I, I was like, I, I'm, I'm more, I think even my ex-wife was like, there's, there's more to me than just being a piece of meat, sustaining and just being able to, to stay in shape. I think for me now, it's also just trying to set a good example for my, for my own children, you know, to, to live a healthy and how healthy life. Yeah, how do your kids feel about, about your... <laughs> My like kids, so so funny. Ironically, <laughs> coincidentally, not ironically, my daughter just came back on Sunday night, like two days ago, and I just took her and her boyfriend and my son to the gym this morning. Oof. It's cool. I think, I mean, I, from a young age, I've always, you know, had them work out. Okay. They're very, very fit. No, but it's funny. I think, yeah, she said, I say, I, I've, I've been hearing about this boyfriend like for like half a year they've been mm. dating and I have never met him. Like I was planning on taking him to a nice dinner or to ah. a lunch, you know. Of course, the first place we meet is, is this morning at the gym. Oh, yeah. 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 This is the first time. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Why is his one rep max? <laughs> He's pretty good <laughs> show. <laughs> It's funny because like my daughter Sage is like, you know, you know, I, I told my, my, my boyfriend, you know, like, uh, like, you know, if you can't bench more than my dad or, or do more pull-ups or run faster, you can't date me and stuff. Yeah. And she's like yeah. teasing him the whole time. Like, and he's like, how do you do? How do you do? I'm like, he's good. He's good. You know, they're yeah. just so smart. Yeah. They're just so, yeah. So I'm happy for them. Yeah. So wow. it was, I've been wanting to meet this guy and I finally met him this morning before your show. I was like, okay, uh, let's see what this, this kid's all about. So he passed too. the hazy? He passed it. Yeah. He passed <laughs> it, yeah. With flying colors. I think you did mention in another interview that now that your kids are more 
more grown up, you kind of wanted to look, shift the focus back to yourself and mm. what you can do. And one of the things that you then turned to was moving to Bali mm -hmm. because there was an opportunity to set up Lodge in the Woods. Yeah, and spending a lot more time in Bali at this uh, beautiful villas called Lodge in the Woods. We have mm -hmm. these beautiful, majestic, you know, white horses, white goats. And I mean, they're all rescue animals too that we have there mm -hmm. that are animals that, you know, that no one wanted, I think also too, but they all just happen to be white. I tease them and say, you're racist because you only have white animals, but, <laughs> but that's of course not the truth. It's, but it adds a certain type of like, you know, I think um, sense of wonder because it's mm. not about, we're not about, you know, trying to do a lot. I think what we want to do is kind of give back to nature. Mm. So we, you know, retain all the trees there. Um, the food there is very, very holistic, very healthy, and it's very peaceful and quiet. Not like a beach club, you know, or like a very loud music mm. and everything too. So it's something that I've just wanted to try something different. You know, I've had a, a rare opportunity to come on board to do marketing for it and also um, do hospitality and PR mm. for it. I think also focus on, you know, I think health and wellness programs and also programs, let's say for children to try and teach them about healthy eating, about fitness and dieting. Mm -hmm. Trying to get people to take a step back and, and see what are really the, the real important things in life beyond just, you know, TikTok and, and, and the social media and all that all that mental health pressure and everything too. Yeah. There's only six rooms, you know, so we're, we're doing really, really well right now. And you've also started your own podcast recently. I did, yeah. And I would love oh. to get you all on maybe individually and stuff there too oh. and, and flip, flip the script. You know? The podcast is called Call Us Daddy and you're actually doing it with Bobby Tanelli. Bobby Tanelli, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. they need a re one real dad, I think, on the show. So yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. And you've just started shooting for it. How has that been? It's been good. We just shot, you know, I think we shot a, quite a few episodes. Hey, sorry, on, what is the theme of the podcast? It's uh, just, I think him and me just talking about life, about different things, anywhere from like, you know, the Singapore entertainment industry to about our own personal love, you know, and also heartbreak okay, okay. to about, you know, what we think is the ideal salary for a man or a woman to feel successful for them Ooh. making, you know, get like a discussion mm. on that. Also, you know, how, whether we can mesh or get along let's say with Gen, Gen, Gen Z's, you know, whether we understand <laughs> their language and everything too. Just everything too. So different topics, I think, because I think we are probably a more of a niche market. I think mm -hmm. women's probably more around your age. I'm probably older, uh, definitely older. So I think it just maybe just gives some people a different perspective. From all of the stories we've heard, right? Like you yeah. are so much about seeking, you know, taking that opportunity and all that. And I think you talked a bit earlier about uh -huh being afraid to settle down too soon because ah. there's still so many things that you wanted to try. And so yeah. I wonder when eventually it did come to having your kids and all that and mm. you know, really growing your roots, how did that change? My children are my, are my everything. They are my heart. You know, I think they, they give me so much purpose. I think all of us, when we go through life, not in a bad way, we're all very selfish. We all live for ourselves. Mm. Do I want to do this podcast? Do mm. I want to see my friends? Do I want to see my parents? Do I want to buy this? Mm. For me, like once I saw, you know, Sage or my daughter come out, I was like, wow, my life suddenly became very selfless. Mm -hmm. Everything was about, you know, trying to do what I can as a parent to give them a life that, you know, that I think they'll be, they'll be, they'll, they'll be happy and healthy. Mm -hmm. And I think so too. So it gave me purpose because I realized through all my travels, like I honestly don't really need that much. I've been blessed to be in an industry where I get a lot of stuff, you know, and I, I have a lot of opportunity, but I realized what is important to me is actually very, very few things is see the people you love happy and healthy and, and provided mm -hmm. for. But, uh, but yeah, it completely just changed, turned my life upside down and everything too. And so when Fly decided to do this call as daddy, I'm like, yeah, it's, 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 it's a good platform for hopefully me. I can impart like, you know, maybe I won't say wisdom, but just my own, I think, personal opinion on mm -hmm. what we can do as parents or as children or as, as citizens or people to, you know, to, you know, I think make our own lives more meaningful and fulfilling and be happier instead of always worrying about, oh, she's making this much money or he's wearing this or this person did this to me. Instead of like, look, I'm, I'm here, I'm alive, I'm healthy. And that, that, that's cool. That's good. So before we close, it's time for us to share our painting of, of the episode. episode. Okay, thank you, Shams. So the Daily Catch Up, if you don't already know, we are proud partners of Shaping Hearts, an all-inclusive arts festival showcasing works from local artists with disabilities. So today's artist feature is Bobby Yo. Hi, Bobby. This painting is called The Sentinel of the Night. Mm. Very nice. <laughs> Very demure. <laughs> yeah, so Bobby is diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Okay. And you can, you can see he uses different colours to to evoke his emotions and tell his stories. So I think Bobby has also shared that there is actually immense joy and fulfillment through painting for him because he finds that it helps him transcend his physical limitations to connect with others on a deeper wow. level. So if you're interested in checking out interesting and meaningful pieces of art such as this, do join us at our Tampanese Hub on the 19th of October for Shaping Hearts Festival. We will be there and we hope to see you there. Thank you very much for coming onto the show and spending this time with us. Like, share, subscribe. We'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you.